Please open your Bibles with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. This afternoon, I want to read a portion of 2 Corinthians 4 that keeps on going into chapter 5, because sometimes you need to just ignore the chapters and verse numbers in your, in your Bible. They are not inspired. They're helpful, but they're not inspired. And as we do so, I want to pay attention to some of the we statements, the things that we do or we think or we feel, all of the emphasis on we and, and us. That's, that's going to be the focus of our study of this passage. And we're going to draw eight simple points from it uh, as we, after having read it. So let's read 2 Corinthians 4, beginning in verse 16. And then we will read on to verse 9 of chapter 5. 2 Corinthians 4, beginning in verse 16. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light, momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling, if indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always of good courage, We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage. And we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. Now as we study these verses, like like I said just a moment ago, we're going to draw eight very simple points from them. Beginning with the first one, we do not lose heart. And these are... These eight points are emphasizing the we statements that Paul gives to us in these verses. So first, we do not lose heart. And Paul has been talking about some of the dangers and the difficulties and the challenges and the demands of the ministry. Expressing that all of that suffering and all of that exertion is worth it so that the nations might come to know the grace of God. And he states that one of the comforts And one of the encouragements that helps him and others to press on in our life in Christ is the precious truth that though our bodies are on an unavoidable crash course with the ground, our inner spiritual life grows and grows and grows day by day. And so he concludes that because of this, we do not lose heart. The weakening and the deterioration of the body and all of the effort that we exert and the dangers that we face, they are not as sharp, they are not as difficult, they are not as oppressive because we know that we are being renewed in the inner man, in the inner man, and so therefore we do not lose heart. In fact, those very challenges, those very afflictions, those very trials often serve to renew the inner man and to promote the spiritual growth of the believer. And so not only do those afflictions lose their sharpness to a degree, but they convert into blessings. They become those things which work work together towards our good. To repeat Paul's words in verse 16, so we do not lose heart. Why? Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. Now the Lord's Supper reminds us of this wonderful truth. How so? The Lord's Supper reminds us that just as assuredly as our bodies are nourished by this bread and as assuredly as our thirst is quenched by the little thimble of wine, nevertheless, 
As surely as those things enter our bodies, so surely we are spiritually fed. As long as we partake by faith, we are spiritually fed by our Lord and Savior, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we are reminded that these are the emblems of a body that died, but a body that also rose from the dead. And so as our bodies are nourished and yet will die, so also we will rise from the dead. And so we look to the sacrifice and resurrection of Jesus in the Lord's Supper, and we do not lose heart because we eat tokens of a body that died and rose again to remind ourselves that we too will die and rise again in him. So we do not lose heart. Secondly, we look to things unseen. We look to things unseen. When Paul's talking about the inner man, he's talking about something that an x-ray won't show. If you x-ray the Christian, the doctor won't say, something amazing is happening. Your inner man is being renewed day by day. I can't believe it. No, it'll look just like everyone's else, everyone else's, and it will be deteriorating. And so the inner man that Paul is speaking of is not visible. It is not tangible. We look to things unseen. And Paul says that not only do we have a vibrant and growing spiritual life now, but we also know that our suffering here and our deaths are preparatory for future glory. And so consequently, we have our, our eyes, our perspective, our hopes set on things that we don't even see. We see our bodies. We see the aches and the pains. My joints hurt. My skin hurts. I'm tired. Everything hurts. All the things hurt. Please stop the world. I'd like to get off now. But that's how we feel. And yet, as Christians, we look to things unseen. Paul says in verses 17 and 18, For this light, momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. And you say, Paul, listen, you can't call my afflictions light or momentary. You don't understand suffering, Paul. And then we say, well, actually, that's not true. Paul definitely understood suffering physically and spiritually. And so Paul talks about our sufferings. He's not devaluing or diminishing them. He's just saying when you compare them to the eternal weight of glory, Again, they pale in comparison. They, they lose their sharpness. They dull. And so we look to things unseen because it changes our perspective. And Paul explains that in verse, 17, in verse 18. Verse 17 says the eternal weight of glory is way bigger than the light momentary afflictions. Why? Verse 18, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient. They're passing. They're temporary. But the things that are unseen are eternal. It's hard for us to have that perspective because the aches and pains are, are right before us. We, we feel them, don't we? Poignantly, we feel them in, in a very sharp way. I'm tired. I'm in pain and such things. And yet Paul tells us that we set our sights on things unseen, understanding by faith, understanding because God has told us that the, the weight of glory is so much greater than the light afflictions. Paul uses those very words light and weight as a contrast. And the Lord's Supper reminds us of these truths. We are reminded of things unseen. And God is so merciful to us that he says, I know your weaknesses. I know your, your difficulties. And so I'm going to give you a visible sign to teach you to set your eyes on that which is unseen. That God, God gives to us baptism and the Lord's Supper as those visible promises that remind us of invisible things. And the bread and the wine, they point us ahead and upward and onward to the eternal life to come. They, they remind us that this is a, the down payment, that this is, the, this is a token until, this is a, a waiting until of a future event, the resurrection of our bodies. And the body and blood of Christ have won for us that eternal weight of glory. Why can I have my sight set on the eternal weight of glory? Because the body and blood of Jesus Christ have won it for me. And so as I contemplate Christ's death, I likewise contemplate those things that are unseen, the eternal weight of glory. And the whole reason why I chose this passage or what, what prompted me to choose this passage for the communion meditation is actually that no surprise, I was reading old wills in my Baptist history research, and someone asked that this passage be preached at their funeral. 
And whenever someone in their will asks that a certain passage be preached, I always look it up because I'm just curious. Okay, what, what words were so precious to them that when they die, they want them to be preached? And this was the passage that the person picked to be preached. It was the very verses that I just read, verses 17 and 18. For this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. That is what they wanted preached at their funeral. And in a, in a sense, we, remember, we commemorate a death as well that pushes us and points us to things unseen in the Lord's Supper. So we do not lose heart. We set our eyes. We, we look at things that are unseen. Thirdly, we know... We have a resurrected body. We know we have a resurrected body. Paul reminds us of what we know. We do not lose heart and we grow as we set our eyes on things unseen because we're not setting our eyes on something unseen in the sense of something vague or indecipherable or abstract, but rather we have a very clear and very specific thing that we simply don't see. We know what it is, but we don't see it. And what that thing is, is the resurrection, in particular, the resurrection of the body. Paul says in verse 1 of chapter 5, for we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, when our bodies die, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And so Paul is using the analogy of a tent to ex- uh, a tent and dwelling in the tent to express the body-soul relationship. Humans are body and soul. The body is the physical, material element. The soul is the immaterial, spiritual element. And so the soul resides in the body. And the Greeks thought that the eternal life would be the soul separated from the body permanently. Eternal life is life without a body. And Paul says, no, we have a building from God, reserved for us. But notice the difference that he uses in this analogy between a tent and a building. The present body is just a tent, a transient, temporary, not lasting, imperfect dwelling place. And yet the resurrected body is called a building. It is an eternal and perfect, permanent dwelling dwelling place for the soul. And so we're not, when we are moved out of this home and into the new one, we're not going to be moved again. For, eter- for all eternity, we will live in resurrected bodies that will be incapable of diminishing or, or tiring or being destroyed in any way or, or harmed. And the bread and the wine of the Lord's Supper remind us that though Jesus died, though his earthly tent was destroyed, that was in order to procure for us a building, namely the resurrected body for our souls. We have a building from God. This is how it was won for you. God got you the building with the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. That was the payment. That was the the mortgage payment in full for your building. And the bread and the wine remind us that though Jesus died, he rose again. His death was not meaningless or vain. Rather, it brought us forgiveness of sins and eternal life in a resurrected body, which we know we have. It is reserved for us. And we await it. We long for it. Which brings us to the next point, number four. We groan in our present body. Paul says twice, we groan in our present body. Now, to be clear, the groaning that Paul speaks of is not complaining and grumbling, but longing and expectation. If our children complain that it's not Christmas yet, we remind them that their complaining won't make it arrive any faster. It's a long way away. And so we would, we would help them not to grumble and complain about the fact that Christmas is coming. That's grumbling and complaining. Why isn't it Christmas yet? Why isn't it my birthday yet? But if they're simply filled with longing and expectation, oh, I can't wait for Christmas. Oh, I can't wait for my birthday. Oh, I can't wait for Sunday. Good job. Yes, that's right. Very good. We wouldn't correct that. There's nothing wrong with longing and expectation. And yet they're, they're pretty similar to grumbling and complaining. When's it going to be Christmas? And I can't wait for Christmas. So when we say in a positive way that we groan in our present body, it's not so much, 
oh, this is horrible and terrible, even though we're in pain and such things, but rather, I can't wait. I can't wait for my resurrected body. I'm longing for the, the inheritance that has been won for me by Jesus Christ. I can't wait for the inheritance that my Father has prepared for me in and through Jesus Christ. And so we groan in our present bodies. We're excited for the future one, and we long for the resurrection. And we're not sinning as we long for it. We're not sinning, sinning by understanding that it's so, so much better, that it's an eternal weight of glory, and we long for it. Paul found this balance in saying to live is Christ, to die is gain. He didn't say to live is, is pointless pain, and to, and to die is, is gain. He said, no, to live is Christ. There is a, there's good to be done and profit to be reaped from living in this present body, and I will serve the Lord now. But when I die, it'll just be even better. That's what Paul is saying. He says in our passage, for in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. It's not just a complaining about the present, but a, a forward-looking desire for the future. If indeed by putting it on, the resurrection, we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened. Not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. And what Paul means in these words is, when we long to die in a sense, understanding what what I mean, what the scriptures mean, we're not longing for our souls to be freed from the bodies, and that's it. That's what it would be to be naked. My soul has been separated from the body. Paul says, no, we don't want to be naked or unclothed. Yes, we want to be unclothed from the present tent, but only so that we can be further clothed, he says, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. There's no, we have no hope for future apart from the resurrected body. There's nothing else that we're hoping for or waiting for other than the resurrection. And though it's true that we will not experience that resurrection until the final resurrection, it is a a, a waiting period, is a time of of expectation. And so there is, there's no afterlife or eternal life that we conceive of other than the resurrected body. And the Lord's Supper is food to keep us going along the way. I can't wait to get there. I can't wait to get there. The Lord's Supper keeps us, keeps us longing, but it keeps us from grumbling and complaining. It's a promise and a preparation because we only partake until Christ comes. And it's designed to keep us joyful and thankful while we're here, not impatient and frustrated. So go ahead and groan in your present body, but groan with all creation, as in Romans 8, longing for the redemption, longing for that final arrival, longing for that resurrection, not grumbling and complaining and accusing God of poor providence for not bringing it sooner when you would like it. No, that would be grumbling and complaining but to long and to hope and to wait and to be expectant is a wonderful wonderful mindset. Indeed, we are commanded to think that way, and the Lord's Supper helps us to say, yes, we long to put off this body and see the new one that Jesus has won for us. And this will feed us along the way. Number five, God has prepared us for this, By giving us the Spirit. God has prepared us for this by giving us the Spirit. In this point, we're breaking the pattern. We can talk all day long about what we do and what we should do and how we think and what our perspectives are and we and we and all these things. But all of it has meaning only because of what God has done for us and in us. And Paul points this out. He's talking about us and our perspectives, and that's great and that's important, and we're we're going through those things. But Paul tells us that the fact that we can have this assured hope, the fact that we are longing for an assured future, is because God has prepared us for this, and until that time, he has given us a guarantee, namely the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. And the scriptures tell us that the Holy Spirit is a seal, a down payment, and a guarantee of our future inheritance. Here's a, here's a portion of something you will experience in greater measure in the future. Here's a down payment. There's more to come afterwards. 
And so the fact that we have the Holy Spirit now as God's authoritative seal, this is mine, I own it, it is mine, as well as an assurance and a guarantee to us, you are mine. Not just, hey, this is mine to others, but to ourselves, hey, you are mine, and I will bring you to myself, and in my presence is fullness of joy, as Psalm 16 says. And so as we are united with God in an initial and wondrous way, so we shall have a fuller and more perfect union with God in the resurrection. Because there's no sin. There's nothing holding us back from a more perfect and complete union with God in the resurrected body being purified from all sin. And we need to be reminded constantly that the Holy Spirit, which is the guarantee of our future inheritance and eternal glory, the Spirit is not a substitute in Christ's absence, but the guarantee of his presence. Jesus doesn't say, I'm going away till I come back. Listen, just be content with the Holy Spirit. No, he says, I will be with you to the end of the age. I will not leave you as orphans. I'm sending my spirit to be with you. So the spirit is not a substitute. Well, if we can't have Jesus with us, we can't have the Holy Spirit. No, rather the Holy Spirit guarantees Christ's presence with us. And that was wonderfully taught to me in in seminary, and I've never forgotten it, and I've repeated it in many sermons because it's so wonderfully helpful. And the Lord's Supper reminds us that the only spirit we have, the, the only reason that we have the Holy Spirit, which is our guarantee, is again because Jesus Christ won it. And at Pentecost, he pours out that Holy Spirit upon the nations through the preaching of the gospel as it goes out in the Great Commission. And so we celebrate Christ's death. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God. The only reason we have the assured hope of heaven is because of what God has done. We celebrate Christ's death. We eat the tokens of his body because the one who prepares us for heaven is God himself. And the Lord's Supper is a visible promise, a sacrament of the new covenant. And Jesus says that the cup is the blood of the covenant poured out for many. And so the Lord's Supper being a visible emblem of the new covenant reminds us of the new covenant in which the promise, one of the promises is that all the people will have the Holy Spirit. They will all know me, says the Lord. I will put my spirit within them. I will give them a heart of flesh. And so as we contemplate the new covenant, we contemplate the basis by which it was purchased for us again. Why do I have the Holy Spirit? Because Jesus covenanted it to me in his blood. Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant. He established it in his blood. He won the spirit for us. And that spirit is the guarantee of the resurrection. Paul draws some conclusions from this. And it's kind of circular. It kind of comes back to where we started. Number six, we are of good courage. We are of good courage. To say we do not lose heart, which was the first point, is kind of putting it negatively. It's not a negative statement, but it's putting it negatively. That's saying, we're not going that way. We don't lose heart. This puts it positively. We are of good courage. Verse 6. So, therefore, because, so we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. I am of good courage. Because the one who has prepared me for this is God. And he has placed this before me, the body and the blood of Christ, visibly represented to me in bread and wine, to remind me that he who has prepared us for this very thing is God. And that he will sustain me all along the way. So we are always of good courage. If if these are the emblems of my body and my blood, somehow there is no courage to be had. Because I can never win, I could never win heaven for myself. I could never win forgiveness for myself and such things. And so my hopeful expectation of the resurrection is not based on anything in me, but in the body and blood of Jesus Christ that won it for me and the gift of the Holy Spirit that seals it to me as a guarantee and preparation. And that keeps me from losing heart. That causes me to be of good, of good courage. That gives me strength to persevere. That enables me to press on. When I look within myself, there's very little, if anything at all, to encourage me along the way. 
But when I set my eyes upon Jesus Christ, I am always of good courage, as Paul says. Because I know, while I'm at home in the body, I'm away from the Lord. And yet, number seven, we walk by faith, not by sight. We walk by faith and not by sight. Paul says that we walk by faith and not by sight, but we need to understand what this means because this kind of language is is very often abused. Walking by faith and not by sight does not mean walking blindly. Well, don't know where I'm going, but I'm walking by faith, not by sight. That's not what it means. Walking by faith means walking assuredly despite of things that I see around me that might speak the contrary to me. It does not mean walking unaware. It does not mean walking uninformedly. I don't know where I'm going, but I'm walking by faith. It means I am assured of the resurrection. And even though the pains and aches of my body say, guess what, you're going to die. I know. I know that I will live. Psalm 89. Yet, I, yet though I die, I will live. And so walking by faith is not well, we'll see what happens, but I know what's going to happen. And so though, I, though he slay me, yet I will trust him, as Job said. That's walking by faith, not by sight. My body tells me one thing. The scriptures tell me another thing. And so Paul's not saying that Christianity is a religion of leaps of faith. Jump off the cliff and you'll be caught. It's not a, it's not a, a religion of walking in darkness. You don't understand it, but just go along with it. Paul says we've been told specifically how we've been saved and what we've been saved from and what we've been saved unto. But if you believe that, then walk by faith. Plant yourself in that, grow in that, and walk in that, and live in that. And so don't fall into that sort of... Some people even even say these things in a positive way. Well, you know, we Christians, we walk by faith and not by sight. And what they mean by that is, well, you know, I don't understand it and these things aren't very clear, but, you know, we walk by faith. Then it's not, it's not well-informed faith. It might be faith, but it's very poorly informed faith because faith is part of faith is knowledge. And that knowledge has been clearly revealed to us in the scriptures for us to stand upon. And the, the means of grace fortify our faith. They replenish our knowledge because we forget things. We have errors in our thoughts and in our knowledge. And so the preaching of the word of God and the the word of God made visible in the sacraments, these things refresh us of what the truth is and how we relate unto it. And so Paul is saying that we know better than what we see. We know better than what we see. That's walking by faith and not by sight, is knowing better than your vision. I know that the dilapidation of my body is a temporary affliction that cannot compare with an eternal weight of glory. That is walking by faith and not by sight. And what feeds my faith, what sustains my faith, what fortifies my faith and my confidence and my trust, the Lord's Supper does. Jesus died for me. Jesus rose for me. Jesus ascended for me. I'm united to him. And as I eat the tokens of his body, which is now glorious... There will come a time when I do not see tokens of my Savior, but my Savior himself. And when I see him as he is, I will be like him, and I will be with him for all eternity. So the Lord's Supper helps us to walk by faith, confident in the promises of God, with eyes wide open, and mind fully informed, and hearts fully assured. And being thus refreshed and refilled and reaffirmed, what do we do? Eighthly, We make it our aim to please him. We make it our aim to please him. Paul says, yes, we are of good courage. And we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord, longing for the resurrection. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. Whether we live or die, our goal is simple. And it's, in many ways, the end of Ecclesiastes. What is the conclusion of the matter? Fear God and keep his commandments. You don't know what's going to happen today. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. But you can trust in God's providence and his wisdom, and you can serve him because he has done so much for you. That's Ecclesiastes. And Paul here says, yes, we would prefer the resurrection. But that hasn't happened yet. And so for now, we make it our aim to please him the one who has prepared us for this very thing and given us the Holy Spirit as a guarantee. 
And so the Lord's Supper, as it fortifies our faith, so also it needs to propel our obedience. As we look to our Savior and gaze upon him and the resurrection that he has won for us, and gazing on him is the same thing because he is the resurrected and ascended Lord and Savior, as we gaze upon our resurrected and glorified Lord, and as we are assured of of our heavenly inheritance, that needs to propel us in the present to a more complete and a more thorough obedience, continuing what was mentioned this morning, that, that turning from sin, that repentance, running away from that which displeases him and making it our aim to please him. And this is a wonderful perspective for believers. When we think about fighting sin, it's very, I was talking about this with some of the young men this afternoon, we were having a good conversation about it. When you talk to people about fighting sin in their life, oftentimes you tell them, and rightly so, you need to hate that sin. You need to hate it more and more and more so that you run from it and see it for what it truly is. And that's true. But you need to couple it with this, if not more so, in fact, most likely more so, you need to love God more than the sin. You need to love, love God as the ultimate good. You need to love him so much that the last thing you want to do is to, to not please him. If you make it your aim to please him, that will help you to run from sin. If all you focus on is hating your sin, your mind is still affected by sin. You're going to convince yourself that that sin is good. It, it's like, to use the example of, of a drug addict, you can tell them time and time again that is, that is hurting you, that is bad for you, and they know that. But in the moment, they will convince themselves that it's good. So if you say you need to hate the drugs, you need to hate the drugs. In the moment, they'll convince themselves that they love the drugs. But if you tell them not only that, which is true, but also you need to love your family. You need to love your spouse or your children or or whoever they're related to. You need to love God. They can't get away from that. They can't decide, well, well, they can decide this, but they they can only go against God saying, well, I'm not going to love my wife, or I'm not going to love my family, or I'm not going to love God, and such things. They have to blatantly reject that. Whereas if it's just about whether or not the sin is good or bad, that's, e- that's easy for them to convince themselves the sin is good. We do it all the time. And so make it your aim to please God. Why, why should I persevere in this holiness? Why should I say no to this sin? Because I love God. Because I love my Savior. Because he has done so much for me. So I want to make it my aim to please him. Indeed, I must make it my aim to please him. I'm waiting for the resurrection despite all of my sin. So I want to make it my aim to please him. And that is the the best perspective of our mortification and 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 our vivification, really the two aspects of sanctification, killing sin and pursuing new spiritual life, is we make it our aim to please him. We have our eyes again set on Jesus Christ. If we look inward just at hating my own sin, that's not going to go well if, if, if it stops there. We need to also look to Jesus and love him above all else. We live unto Christ, our risen and exalted Savior, because our life is from Christ, and so our life is for Christ. And so, brothers and sisters, let us partake of this sacrament, this promise made visible with joyous hearts awaiting the return of our Savior and the redemption of our bodies in the glorious resurrection. Amen. Let's pray.